Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. It's a beautiful Sunday here in New York City. Mother's Day. Yes. Happy Mother's, happy Day. Mother's, Day, happy Mother's Day, Day to the mothers and happy Mother's Day to the mothers of, of you all. Um, I, my name is Therese Eyring. I'm the executive director of TCG Theater Communications Group, and I'm really happy to be here to try to facilitate a discussion with all of you about uh, the Five Boroughs One City project. And I just want to say I think this project is amazing, it's ambitious, it is creative, and gets at the idea of, of really engaging community in the process of making theater in a way that is new and I think really is going to um, inspire a lot of others to try to make work in similar ways. Um, and for to tr inspire community members in our city, but maybe you know in other cities around the country to get involved in theater making as well. Um, so I want to start out just by asking everyone here, artists and working theater, to just introduce yourselves, starting with Tamala. Hi, I'm Tamala Woodard, and I'm the artistic director of the initiative that uh, called the Five Boroughs One City Project that Working Theater is engaged in. I'm Adam Krar, playwright, and I was part of the team uh, writing about Queens, specifically Electchester. And I'm Rachel Falcone, and I'm a documentary producer, and I got to be one of the creators of the Manhattan Project. And I'm Mark Pleasant. I am the producing artistic director of the Working Theater. Uh, I'm Anna Martinano. Uh, I'm a director and part of the Brooklyn team this week. Uh, hello, I'm Ed Cardona. I'm the playwright with the Brooklyn team, specifically uh, Bushwick. I am Kristen Horton, and I'm uh, part of the Staten Island team. I'm, I'm a director. I'm Chisa Hutchinson. I am a playwright who is also part of the team for Staten Island. Cool. Um, what I want to start out with is just hearing from Mark. Um, where did the idea come from for you to launch into this project? I know you're celebrating your 30th anniversary, but what made you think of doing this particular project? Well, we have for a long time been trying to figure out ways to engage our particular audience of working people uh, more in a deeper way. Um, and uh, so it's two ideas, that and also the, the notion of bringing theater to communities where working people live, um, which we were actually able to do. We, we uh, produced a play that uh, we commissioned Ed to write called La Ruta, which was about uh, people crossing the border to come to America to find work. And it was inside an actual truck, so we were able to move that truck to various neighborhoods where working people lived. Um, but we wanted it; we wanted to take it a step further and really engage uh, even the communities themselves in the idea of actually creating a piece of theater by engaging with the community. Felt just sort of like a natural thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. So that was really the impetus. It was just a, we wanted to dig deeper, deeper roots in these various communities that we'd already sort of partially engaged with by bringing the theater to them. And then um, you engaged Tamala as artistic director of the project overall. Yes. Tamala. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tell us how you um, thought about, how, did you bring the team of artists together for each of the projects? And if so, um, how did you make decisions about who should be involved in the project? Well, we started thinking about, like, for me, a really big part of the work that I love in the theater is, is collaboration. And so it's like, who are great collaborators? Or who are really who are people who are bursting to make something in a way that is a more lateral way? Mm -hmm. um, um, and that was the beginning of our, our discussion about who are the kinds of people who would prosper um, in this kind of environment and benefit from this experience. And so um, that, that, was, that was really the, the, the list. And like folks who, who are, you know, work so long really well, maybe not, this is not <laughs> the place for them. Mm -hmm. Because it's really about not just engaging with your other collaborator, but engaging with the community as um, source for you and resource and being willing to be changed um, by what you're hearing and seeing and feeling in that world and being okay with taking a chance with your own artistic process. Mm -hmm. And so we needed people who wanted to wanted to take a chance with their own process. And that's, you know, that was how we started. That's great. I think <laughs> she was like, oh, 
<laughs> I think it would be really helpful for uh, people in the audience, people who are, are listening in um, or here with us, who may not have seen any or maybe just a few of the pieces to hear from each of the teams, just a little bit about, maybe a, a couple minutes about the community you were in, the story that is evolving through your connection in that community, um, and maybe some of the things that you're learning or how you're, you know, how you're imagining the, the piece to be produced ultimately, you know, whether in a traditional setting or more in a, a site-specific way. Um, let's start with you, Chisa. Oh, okay. You're to my right. Um, well, I, uh, again, was uh, writing about Staten Island, and before this project, I really didn't know much of anything about Staten Island, as I imagine there are a lot of people who don't know <laughs> a lot about Staten Island. Um, and what I, dis what I discovered through, um, you know, visiting um, and interviewing people and sitting in on you know, classes at the college and having dinners and um, a thing that I discovered is that for the most part there's a big part of that community on Staten Island who they want to keep it that way that like no one knows anything about Staten Island and they're just <laughs> totally totally happy with that um, so it was really hard the process of like actually um, getting uh, all of the perspective that we wanted to sort of squeeze into the piece. Um, it, it was a tough process um, sometimes. Um, but I think uh, we got enough you know, information through the, the research and the people that we are, were able to talk to. And even, I think, um, from the people that we weren't necessarily, um, I think the, the absence of where the absence of a voice is probably just as was just as helpful hmm. in a way. Um, <coughs> so there was that, and then am I supposed to talk about the actual like? Yeah, just a couple, just a little <laughs> synopsis of the story. Oh ah, well, it's um, a traditional Italian American family style dinner. It's like a family reunion. It's the Gibalisco family reunion and all is well and everyone is eating and having a good time and then in comes the other, this uh, interloper, <coughs> the black boyfriend of one of the daughters. Um, the twist is of course that all of the Italian American characters are being played by black actors and then the lone black character is being played by a white guy. Uh, and it's, it's very um, the audience is the family. The audience is sort of invited into the event as, um, as family. Um, so they get to be right there and, and feel the tension and um, you know, um, sort of relate to these people who are feeling things as their um, family dinner is being interrupted. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Ooh. Ed? Um, Brooklyn. Uh, <coughs> I thought we were going here next. So I'm going to throw my right <laughs> um, <laughs> in, uh, specifically Bushwick. It, it's um, about some residents who kind of come come to uh, a corner of Bushwick, play dominoes, and there are some street artists uh, who are going to come uh, to this where they play. There's a wall, and they're coming to put up a mural on this wall. So they uh, have to kind of uh, interact with these Bushwick natives, or Bushwick residents, I should say, because they're not all natives. Um, and the kind of the story uh, takes off from there um, with penguins and polar bears. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that. I that in there. I don't know, I don't know if you uh, want to add anything else. Or, uh, that's pretty much the, the basic story. We'll come back to the door. Well, no, go ahead. Just, just from the research period, something that for me was the most touching, and probably everybody, or most of the people here, already heard this story, but I feel like I have to say it again. Uh, we were um, in, in the, just approaching people on the street in the neighborhood, which was a major part of our research. We also had arranged interviews, but also just walked and approached. And we see some interesting uh, people in the park, so we decided to just go right into them and ask them if they 
tells them that we have this project about Bushwick residents and they want to talk to us. They are very, very happy to talk to us. Uh, and then when we say it's about Bushwick residents, they start hesitating. And uh, one of them says, well, we live here basically, I'm born here, but, um, and lived here all my life, but uh, since two years ago, I'm homeless. So I, I don't know if I can say that I'm a Bushwick resident since I don't have a home. Even that he was living a street, like from the park on the cartridge. And this idea of uh, people uh, not feeling that they belong to a neighborhood even anymore, or to a city, just because they don't own an actual place there, uh, to me at least, um, made the core of the search for the home play. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel, do you want to talk about your project? Sure. So we were fortunate enough to be matched with this um, amazingly vast, beautiful space um, in Morningside Heights, St. John the Divine. It's a cathedral. And um, going in, you feel like you're kind of entering this mini city. And what we came to learn pretty quickly is that there's so many different elements of the cathedral complex. There's a school, there's social services. But one of the first things we were struck with going to one of the mass, like the, the Sunday services, uh, was just that there was, I mean, there's a bunch of people that are tourists that are coming, that are just coming for the first time and probably won't ever come back. But then there's obviously people that are kind of volunteering as part of the service and that are coming regularly. And so that was one of, I think, our first fascination, which is who are the people that are coming to this place to worship and what does that mean? Um, it was also a time when sort of the protests around Black Lives Matter was coming to a head in the fall. And so it was interesting, one of the first sermons was about this idea of Black Lives Matter. <coughs> and they were sort of very much bringing that into the, in the, into the service. And we were starting to think about some, you know, what is the role of churches in, the, in terms of sanctuary and our journey to, towards sanctuary now, you know, and how does that relate to it was in the civil rights era. And I think, interestingly, we were sort of very, you know, our piece as we presented for the workshop was very much molded by the people that we talked to. I think, interestingly, a lot of them talked about their journey with faith, and, um, and so that is very present in the piece now. It's, it's less of a secular journey, it's more of a real religious journey. And, um, and so we did actually different things, and at the cathedral we were able to do a, a, an actual walking performance where we brought people from chapel to chapel. They had this uh, beautiful chapels that ring the nave, that are actually named after immigrant groups that were prevalent at the time of um, the founding of Ellis Island, back when the cathedral was built. And so we kind of were playing with that idea of also thinking about um, people coming to a place and being a stranger, and, and so what does that mean? And so, so the piece, I think, as we've been envisioning it, combines um, original lyrics, songs, um, as well as interview text that's both performed and in audio recordings. But it's also a, a sort of a moving piece where we take the audience on a journey Mm. Adam. Uh, well, uh, G Gay Taylor Upchurch and I were, were sent to a Leicester Queens. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I, I, as, as with many people in the city, I'd never heard of it. And it's, it's really a unique, to me, a, a unique corner of New York City. It's, a Leicester is a large housing complex built in the early 50s by the local three uh, electricians union. And, um, and still uh, many, many of the people, perhaps 50 to 60 percent of the people living there are, are members of the union or, the, or their families or descendants of their families. Um, and a lot of a lot of the union activity, the union hall, their health facilities, um, are, are also on the edge of Electchester. So it's so it's in some ways uh, a working class utopia unto itself. Um, and and for for many people living there, especially the ones in the union, there's there's a a fierce and, and lovely sense of community there. Um, that's that's changed a lot in the last thirty years as the as the demographics of the place and, and Queens have changed. It's in Flushing Queens, um, and and but we were also very interested in surrounding neighborhoods and, and chiefly right across 
Parsons Boulevard from Electchester is Pominock, um, a, a, a low-income housing project, um, and and so and and we we were among other things got very interested in the very complex relationship between Pominock, um, which which is which is in some ways a difficult place to live, as, as we learned, and Electchester, which is in many ways a wonderful place to live, and, and the ways in which the people in Electchester are insulated from Pominock, um, and some of the ways in which people in Electchester are, there is, for some of them, an undercurrent of racism, and yet many of the people who are part of the community in Electchester are, are of color and, and are part of the union. So the, so the complexity of attitudes about race and class was just uh, w w gripping, and, and we wanted to um, we wanted to, to capture capture that as much as tell a story. Um, so so in some ways the play is is a play with a multitude of voices, but it but the story that takes us through this multitude of voices is about two young electricians. Uh, new, fairly new to the to the culture of the union, uh, who move to elect Chester, fall in love with it, and then discover the various things about their identity and their time that they have to give up in order to be a part of this community, and how that and the stri the, the deep strains that puts on the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about Dan Boyle and Maureen's? Projects and yes. Projects. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in the Bronx, we um, had the team of Dan Hoyle, who's a solo performer and a playwright, uh, and Maureen Tavi, who's a director, and they were team. They, so, so each of the projects had a community venue, a, what we were called the venue host, uh, which in the case of Staten Island was Snug Harbor. Uh, in Bushwick, it, it changed a bit, but ultimately it was the Salvation Army Community Center, St. John the Divine in Manhattan, the Leicester in Queens. In the Bronx, it was New Settlement Apartments, um, which is a uh, housing complex in the Bronx. Um, but it, as part of New Settlement Houses, there is an organization called CASA, and CASA is a tenants' rights organization, um, and that has, I think, a thousand members, um, many of whom live in New Settlement or in apartments around around the neighborhood of the South Bronx where they were. So they uh, were exploring that community and have written a play called the uh, a play called The Block, um, which sort of talks about the, the really the lives of the residents of that sort of street in, in the Bronx in the South Bronx. So, yeah. so when you're entering a community, and, and this may, I'm sure, is different for each of you, but how do you, what kind of agreements do you make with the people you're talking to and with the people whose stories you're ultimately going to tell? I mean, what's the process like? Um, I don't know if permission is the right word, but how do you um, make sure that you're representing and have people's, um, have people's blessing, if you will, to be telling their story, or do you not? And I'm going to start with Kristen because. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, our process has largely been comprised of individual interviews with people. We've had a couple of, of small groups, and I think the the, the key things that uh, have been important to us are just sharing the intentions of the project. Um, so you know, talking about what what we're doing, our goals, the intention. Um, for us, confidentiality was important. That you know, we're not writing one person's mm -hmm. story. We're not going to feature one person's story. And if that were to happen, you know, I would imagine that we would, you know, talk to that person. But that aspects of the stories that we've heard find their way, I think, in, into the piece. There, there's a couple of specific references uh, in, in Breaking Bread that came from 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 interviews uh, that we had with people. But I, I think the the main thing is is also keeping the dialogue going, mm -hmm. because we're profoundly interested in, in, in what experiences uh, inform people's opinions. Because mm -hmm. people have opinions about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and especially right now on Staten Island, right. uh, you know, especially uh, post Eric Garner, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, that, that's, that's been under the surface of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're curious about, or, or what are those stories that inform people's opinions? Anyone else care to comment on that? Um, 
I came to think of it in some ways as, as a collaboration, um, even though they weren't, they, they, they weren't strictly part of our collaborative team as, as artists. Um, the people who were, were kind of m most, most helpful and, and most illuminating about their community uh, were people that, that we kind of went beyond the relationship of we're, we're gathering information <coughs> from you and they, and you know, as Kristen said, um, they, they began to really trust that, that our, you know, one of our chief aims was to, to learn from them, what is it about your neighborhood that you want the rest of New York City and the world to know about, about your, your place, your, your home? And once they saw that's really, in large measure, what we were about, um, they became kind of, they became fairly invested in it. And, and wanted to, especially those who, who loved who loved their community, but even the ones who were very angry about their community, wanted to make sure that that was that that was represented, and and so that that was part of it. And I think, I think he, and in some cases, um, developing sort of ongoing friendships with with some of these people was was huge in terms of of involving them in the process. I think for us, because um, we tended to do more formal interviews and we actually recorded them, um, there's this you know opportunity to kind of sit down with someone and say, what does that mean that we might share this later? And, and sort of during the conversation, we're really upfront about if there's anything that you, you know, we want to talk about, but then we decide you don't want to share. Then, you know, we just have that conversation kind of upfront as we're sitting down. And we did some informal interviews and then you know, we met with people, I, I went to different events at the, at the cathedral and met people and then said, well, let's sit down for a conversation and I'd like to record it. And sort of that shift from a more informal dialogue to something that they're comfortable. I think with this, because it was smaller compared to some of the other projects that I've done, it was kind of great because we were able to really just keep that dialogue going. So I was able to touch base with all the people that were featured in it, particularly because we were, we were really using direct excerpts from the interviews. and and sort of you know, naming people in the program as part of that, that this was their voice. And so I double checked with everybody about what content was going to be shared so that they were comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. and a couple of, uh, for me, uh, it was two very distinct experiences. We had some formal interviews set up. Um, those were usually folks that, you know, one would consider the kind of the new wave into Bushwick, uh, who were very eager to talk to us because they're very excited about what's happening in Bushwick um, and living in that neighborhood and how it's you know hip and it, it, you know exciting and vibrant to live in that neighborhood. And then there was some of the not so formal interviews that we did a lot of walk-ups, like Anna mentioned, uh, who at first were a little hesitant. Um, and a lot of those individuals were were new immigrant groups, um, so there's you know there's plenty of reasons why they might be a little hesitant. To talk to a couple strangers, just kind of cold walking up to them. But once we explained the project to them, uh, it was a uh, you know we we're writing a play, doing research, writing a play. Um, in the end, most of them uh, warmed up to us and were rather open and kind of eager to share their experiences. There was a couple individuals I, m I remember specifically about uh, a man who definitely didn't want to talk to us, but we got his son to talk to us. But that whole conversation is very kind of very guarded in many many ways, where his father was still standing there and his son was here. Um, so we did get some of those, but it, it, overall, I felt that once we kind of let them know what the project was about, um, they were pretty willing to talk to us. The only thing that I would add to that is that about the ones not arranged that we just straight cold approach. Uh, and, and specifically to me, those who refused us and didn't want to talk, and like most of them didn't speak English, so we had that approach in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, somehow they gave to our project as much as the ones who did talk. Mm -hmm. That's what because they, yeah, they, they, they still. Um, they, they still said stuff about themselves, I even by, by refusing us. So I don't know if that makes us a bit of a thieves in, in getting our inspiration, but we, we did took our inspiration even from the people who did not talk to us. 
That's really interesting. I, I kind of um, I'm interested in knowing, and this is inspired in part by something Tamala said earlier, um, which is about all the different connections you all were able to see in each other's work as, you know, just a lot of similarities in your experiences, both making the work and in the themes in the stories themselves. But um, one thing I just have to say is, having seen your piece last night, I'm very interested in what made you decide to move the audience. Um, am I giving something away? No, no, no. It was very, I mean, I sat down in, in the front row and I was asked what I paid for my ticket and then I was, <laughs> I just gave it away. <laughs> and, then, and then asked to move, but it was really interesting, the moving the audience um, throughout the piece, which also really added a sense of what it feels like to be in a community where you're being moved against your will or without expecting to be moved on a somewhat regular basis. It, it, it goes a bit back to the research. My, my preconceptual idea was we won't talk about gentrification in Bushwick because it's too, just too <laughs> first. Gentrification, yeah. 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 So we, we'll find something else, we must have. <laughs> But then we, we kept talking with people, and I remember basically after each evening or at the end of each day, we were kind of with all these interviews, and gentrification was keep and, and not gentri what, what is gentrification? The fact that you are displaced, you have to move, you don't want to move, you feel you have a right to be in a place, and the right is, is taken out of you. And this subject came, uh, 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 kept coming and coming and coming, and in the same, kept being somehow pushed out by each venue that we approached, uh, <laughs> saying initially yes and then closing on us. Oh, no. So we yeah. end up like basically not having a venue until the very last moment. Um, or, or having a venue but each day another one or each week a different one. Uh, so. I, we kind of felt, uh, I, I remember we were searching with, with Mark and Ben for new venues at some moment during the process. And we literally walked into like the Salvation Army mm -hmm. and yeah. called and asked. Yeah. And, and some of them were like, if it would be summer, we would just go on the sidewalk and, right. and do it on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> and not on the sidewalk in Bushwick, but in a neighborhood. Which Because we've been pushed out. Of, and I really it's a feeling somehow that it's, I mean, you understand it, but if you don't feel it, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it was my easiest way to make the audience members experience that and hopefully connect it with what happens in those scenes. It's very effective. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and if I could just, just touch upon that, it was almost, as I said, we were hoping to kind of crack into something else besides gentrification, because that was the obvious choice. But it was almost, it was impossible to write about anything else. <laughs> with, with everybody you talked to, no matter what generation, what color, it all came back to the rent, which in the end is the big issue. Um, you know, rents are raising, people are getting pushed out. And it, it just, it's about, you know, as a writer, you kind of want to write, you know, what you're inspired by and what you want to write, but sometimes, uh, can't really write what you want to write. You need to write what needs to be told. Mm -hmm. Did I make? Did I make any sense? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So then we, I kind of surrendered to that, um, and then yeah. There was a member of Casa that was here to see dance play, and they came earlier. And in your play was before, and very much they're dealing with tenants' rights and and how to stay in the place that they call home. And he said to me at the end of the night, the very end of the night, he's like the experience he had in Brooklyn was how it feels to live in the box right now. And he wanted to say thank you to you guys mm -hmm. for like in a very clear way, making that be a part, like watching everybody else move. He's like, see, see, that's what it's like. Yeah. And so that was his experience being, you know, being one of the resources that Dan used for, for the Bronx. And he thought like, you know, you guys were in a deep conversation mm -hmm. um, about his experience too. What has happened when members of the community have seen these pieces? Have you had, have they been performed in the communities? Yes. Yes. I, I, what, I'm have just, you been, I'm just you? Say uniformly, generally, uh, in front of the communities, it's been like 
glorious. They loved it. They felt, you know, so represented. I'll just yeah. say that. And then, and it's it's definitely um, sparked up honest conversations, um, which many felt eager to share, right. and probably didn't have the avenue to share. So they really kind of got into it. And it, and in one of the readings, definitely uh, touched the nerve with a couple of of the residents. Uh, the um, were the newer oh, way the newer yeah. residents, newer residents <laughs> but, but the, their experience is just as you know, yeah, important to the, to the, the beach. Yeah. So all of the so one of the the model is is and the model will continue to be that the projects are are, are created inside of the community. They are premiere, they're shown first to the community, shared first with that community, that their feedback is invited about that continuously. And then it's, it's, it's taken to a place that is not the community to see what is the relationship that the larger New York has to this question um, or to this, this exploration. Um, that the team is going through. And so very practically, that's what we did. The very first um, sharings, public uh, viewings of these pieces were inside the communities, um, in front of the people who had been talking to these audiences as much as, as that was possible. And then we engaged in a whole nother week of work that was in response to what they were getting, um, to what the, uh, the, the community audience said and brought it here to Manhattan to mostly people who were not residents of that, of, of Bushwick or um, South Bronx or North Shore, Staten Island or Leicester or congregate members, and had them respond to that as strangers, as outsiders. I have a, I have a question, actually, based on that. Because um, I was just curious, you know, listening to the Leicester uh, play, there's so many similarities within that closed community with what we've experienced in terms of the dynamics of Staten Island. And so are you imagining, Tamil, at some point that, for example, Breaking Bread might be at a Leicester? That's exactly yes. what we're that's, so. exactly. That's, that's, awesome. that's, that's the point is that we're, we want to turn each of the pieces mm -hmm. back to each of the other community that's venues. Great. Yeah, that's absolutely. Great. And that there hopefully will be some kind of cross-neighborhood dialogue yeah. that will be generated as a result. And for how many of you, or is this way of making theater really different from what you're used to, what you, how you normally approach your work. Yeah. I see you yeah. <laughs> um, I've, mm, and This is not to say that I haven't worked on projects that aren't necessarily my, my particular personal vision of a thing, um, but this I think more than anything that I have ever written is has definitely been. Um, I, I'm just trying to channel, you know, whatever I'm, you know, whatever it is that I'm hearing and sensing and and seeing, and I just want to kind of like, like vomit it back, and you know, and then have people pick through the chunks, you know, just or, or just like you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know what I mean, I'm just like, all right, I'm gonna metabolize this, and then you know, and then. Okay, respond as you will, but um, the material is is really not not like I I think she uh, the stage directions the introduction of the play was like breaking bread an event right she, because it's not like my play it's not mm -hmm. and and that is very odd to me because every almost every other play that I've written has been like just my little brainchild that you know um, with. I'm not going to say no input from anyone else, but I mean, definitely not um, as as research based, like really very, very much research based. Um, so yeah, it, it, but it was it's very liberating, you know, because you're just and you can't take anything personally. Like when when you get uh, when I got feedback from the community, it was just like, oh yeah, you know, and I just wanted to do whatever whatever would make the piece more authentic or more meaningful for mm -hmm. the community that I was trying to reflect. So um, I, if someone says, oh, that voice, that's not authentic at all, and she wouldn't say that, and oh, uh, you know, you need to put more of this in there, I would listen because, I mean, that's, they would know, you know, right? right. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a pretty, it was a very liberating experience, it was. 
You're gonna do it again? I would. All right. I would. <laughs> and continue with this project, of course. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, this, uh, is this a different way of working for you? Yes. Um. I, I, yeah, I guess I would say yeah. Because <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm very collaborative, even when it's in my own work. Once, um, you know, I go into the kind of the, the reading process and then in rehearsals, you know, for me, I try to make it clear to everybody, as brutal as it can be sometimes, that, you know, nothing's precious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, this thing can continue to grow. But in regards to kind of starting from, that's usually I have something already. And then we're building off of that mm -hmm. as a collaboration. But this, we had nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and actually researching and uh, which that um, and, and reaching out to the community, that is a different experience for me. And thank God I had Anna because she's actually very good at it. Um, so she always did the lead. Mm -hmm. um, and it just was a new experience for me in, in trying to um, um, you know, hear these different voices being thrown at you. And then at the same time digesting that us as, as a group and then seeing what if we heard the same thing and trying to put that on the page. Um, and then, um, you know, especially with our piece and we're moving people around and, you know, people are ending out, you know, at the end of the play, not even, you know, seeing the ending. So then we had a lot of discussions about that, that in regards to collaboration. So of course, as a writer, you want them to be there. But, um, but, but, it's, but knowing that from the get-go, this was a collaborative um, project, you have to kind of be open to that. And I, I, I think, I don't know how that feels, we, I, you know, I, was, I feel blessed that we had a kind of a good, you know, I'm sure we drove each other a little crazy every now and then. Uh, but I feel in the end we kind of worked well together and, and it was a great experience. I would definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like our team all do d different kind of community-based engagement work. Um, Carrie Dodd do is a playwright, but she does a lot of work in community. Um, and then Michael and I have worked together for about eight years doing really interview-based work and community-based work. I feel like I'm kind of the one that craves to do the solo project because I never because most of my work is all is all community based. So so this felt really natural. I think what's unique is that although um, Mike and Carrie Dodd have background in theater, I don't, and so that was really fun for for me to feel like we could take a lot of this interview based practice and then use it as part of performance and and where the line between installation and performance was. That was a lot of fun. And for me, it was definitely a departure from how I usually write a play, because usually I start from something deep inside that I often can't even articulate, and here it was very patently at the beginning, starting with the community and what, what they wanted New York City to know about them. The other way in which it was, was so different um, is, is the nature of the collaboration with, with my director and the actors, um, because when, even when the text was in a really embryonic state, um, GT and I were able to, she was able to look at this, this you know, very, very early draft and, and sort of because of our shared experiences there, the people we knew, um, able to really understand what, what the play wanted to be um, even when that wasn't, wasn't realized on the page. So that, that was very useful and it was a useful reference point too uh, because if I didn't understand something that GT was talking about or vice versa about what this play was becoming, we'd say, well, remember, remember the guy that we met at the bowling alley uh, 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 who was you know, so, so squirrely? And, and that, would, that would instantly, much quicker than talking about motivation or, or storyline, <laughs> that, that would open up a lot of things. And, and this, we brought the same thing to the working with the actors. And I, I was amazed at how effective it was that rather than, again, rather than going deeply into psychology um, and, and the, the sort of the arc of the play, which certainly we talked about a bit, um, often we would just share our experiences in general about, you know, about the ambitions of these various people in these communities, about the culture, the things that they don't talk about, and, and the actors would just, without saying much more, the actors would then 
then bring that into very specific character motivations. It would really activate them. And how, I think, I, th I, don't know, I don't know, you know, that's the mystery of acting, but it, but it would, um, it really, that it really allowed them to take a leap when they heard that, yes, there, there really is a guy that, that talks like this, and, and this is why, and this is, this is the, the context in which he's in that makes him talk in this, this strange way, and they, they, they bought it. It's really the, the idea of um, trying to find out what one community would like another community in New York to know about them. It's such a beautiful thing, because I just, I didn't, the ones that I saw, um, I felt that. I felt like I'm learning something about this community that I really didn't know. And um, they're just really beautifully constructed and, and the stories are, are wonderful. So I feel as if, you know, you're onto something, Mark. Where's this gonna go <laughs> well, <laughs> next? Yeah, we, well, so these, this has really been the sort of research and development phase, essentially. I mean, we, we, we wanted to share them with various communities as well. But they're all very much in development, all five of the plays. And the, the goal is to produce each one, fully produce each one over the next couple of seasons, and tour them to back to each of the venues. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you feel, I mean, it just seems as if um, theater as being central in community life in some way and relevant and civically important is something that you know most theater artists care about and this project it seems to me just brings it right front and center it's like you cannot avoid <laughs> the fact that this is really bringing communities together and bringing artists and community together and it isn't always i mean you mentioned it's not in every case was it co-creation per se right. um, but a highly collaborative process among artists and community. Um, so it, it feels as if there's you're onto something that. that well, there's a challenge though community. now at this point I'm, that I'm still I don't know the answer to it. But the challenge is how do you keep that community engaged as we continue to develop mm -hmm. each of the pieces, and that is something. I think we've all looked at this. I mean, the working theater has been a very traditional producing theater company. I mean, this is an, a new step for us. And so we've just been exploring it as we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, we're working with artists who are very respectful of the communities that they've been in, so it's all been good. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it could have gone not so good. <laughs> um, but it's gone very well. But now the next sort of phase of challenge that we're in, and exploration and learning that we're going to have as a theater company is, well, how do you keep those communities engaged uh, mm -hmm. as you more fully develop each of these works? I don't know if anyone even wants to respond to that, maybe. I mean, we, we haven't as a group had that conversation yet, but we will. Maybe we can yeah. start it now. My hope would be to try to uh, have kind of a, a round table, because uh, we, we, we really never had that. We always spoke to individuals. I mean, I spoke to a group one time at, uh, at a senior center, um, but they were still all, they were employees of the senior center, but they were all, uh, residents of Bushwick, lifelong residents. Um, so it, for me, it'd be interesting roundtable uh, various perspectives mm -hmm. and have them, which, which, which happened a little bit in the second meeting we had, where we had a, a young woman who was a Bushwick resident, born and raised, and then we had another young woman who had lived in Bushwick for seven years, um, and, or, or five, yeah, five or six, seven years, I don't remember. But, um, and the, it was the interesting, interesting um, kind of discussion that they were having and how they perceived each other. Um, to, to, so to get those different perspectives around the table at the same time, I, I feel would be very interesting uh, moving forward. And do you think ultimately, um, we have the saying at TCG, a better world for theater and better world because of theater. Do you feel ultimately, I, I, and I think any theater can make the world better or even change the world, but do you feel ultimately can you see ways in which the work that you're doing is going to improve um, our community in some way? Or, and if so, how? Well, I, 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 we heard that out in Alechester from, um, well, I heard it both from people who live in Alechester and from, from one person who lived in, in Pominock that, that um, 
they, they felt it would start certain conversations that, that they felt needed to be had. Um, but also, again, I think, I think, um, I think it was ins inspiring <laughs> to, the, to, to a lot of the people who recognized um, their stories in this. Um, I think they saw new meaning in, in their stories. I mean, that people, people hinted at some things, and they see, some people seemed really, really moved by it. But, but that, was, that was very much the feeling I got from, from a lot of the people in Olechester, that, that they just, they, they really want, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to help with, make, where's it going next? What can we, you know, no. what do we do? Can we do, should we, here's some, I want you to call me. I want to give you, these, this, this resource material. I want to tell you about growing up in a Leicester. There was a lot of they, 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 when they saw it, they got very invested in wanting to give more to it. Mm -hmm. I'd expand that to include new meaning and experience, mm -hmm. and experience in living in community, because I think that what's interesting about several of the pieces is that they have some sort of interactive or immersive mm -hmm. uh, quality to them in terms of the construction of the event itself. And there's something about you know theater. It, it naturally brings people together physically in in a shared space. And a word that that you used early on, which I think has been really powerful in our in our process in terms of thinking about where the piece goes, is when I asked you what do you want this piece to do, and you said I want to create a bridge. Hmm. I want the piece to create a bridge between disparate communities. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the powerful elements of just this whole enterprise, especially this idea, you know, of taking the projects to the other venues, uh, because within each of the projects, I mean, you, you, you see um, issues and concerns um, that I think are shared by everybody. They just might be more concentrated in one community over another, and that's that's exciting, mm -hmm. really. And I think what the project does is it brings all these really diverse stories that might not make it into theater into mm. theater. I mean that's that, I mean that's the heart of it. It's kind of the obvious thing, yeah. but it's it's really incredible mm. when you get to see the different pieces, mm. how these stories are not necessarily heard necessarily in mainstream theater. And so I think that's really beautiful. I think also there's exciting moments that we're all trying to push within the communities where people that maybe part of that community don't recognize each other or don't mm -hmm. and so through the power of art we're able to say your story alongside or show someone something new like i was really excited that uh two staff members you know someone was hearing someone else's story and they've been a colleague for years and never knew that aspect of their colleague's mm -hmm. life or history and so the ability to sort of build help be a part of building community and using art to do that within the neighborhoods that we're drawing the pieces from and then bring that to other Um, are there any questions or observations from members of our audience here? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, so much, so much, you have to compartmentalize it, I guess. Uh, I've been involved as an audience member and working with Mark at the Working Theater for about five years, and I was lucky enough to get involved with him, like, fresh out of college, mm -hmm. and it's like, here was this embodiment of this wide-eyed college idea of using theater for social justice, for community involvement, for what all of you have been talking about. And so, of course it's relevant. I mean, everything I saw yesterday here, and I saw all five of them, was relevant. Um, and it does force a discussion. Mm -hmm. Like you can read in the newspaper about the, the racial tensions that seem to be boiling now, in my lifetime, at least now more than ever. And at least as a white guy, I guess you can say, yeah, that's horrible, and compartmentalize it. But when you're sitting at a table, <laughs> eating food <laughs> with actors who are living this conversation about uh, the other disrupting their, their worldview or whatever, I mean, it, you can't help but think, oh my god, like, what, what do we do? <laughs> and what you do is continue the, the conversation. So it's just, you know. And the same thing with the, the moving, moving the seats. I thought that was very effective because, and just more so, that anything you could read, you're experiencing it yourself. And Did you ever find out what happened at the end of the play about Brooklyn? <laughs> yeah, I, I refused to move. <laughs> Do tell what happened at the end. I moved. <laughs> You'll have to see. <laughs> I have a question.
question, I think, for the playwrights. Uh, so, and you were speaking with us, Jesus, when you basically taking what people are telling you, you know, their stories, what they are, and this is particularly true in the Bronx <clears throat> piece, uh, you, you're, you're trying to write that as realistically as possible, as portray that as accurately as possible, especially when that community is going to be viewing that work. And, uh, but as a playwright who has a point of view of your own, yeah, at what point <laughs> do, does, do you then step in and start, you know, as this project moves forward, you're in development, start to look at this as, well, I'm going to write a play here that is part of something that would fit nicely with the other plays I've written, taking their stories and moving it into your own point of view. Now, I think it's not just for Jesus, it's for all the playwrights. At what point do you assert your playwright point of view, you know, on I these pieces? I think I already have, yeah. honestly, uh, in many ways, um, because um, <clears throat> you know you draw inspiration from it, but in the end, um, you know, I personally, when I'm you know creating these characters, um, in many ways, still feel like they're one hundred percent my characters that I create, and though I might have stolen a line that I actually heard on the street from one of our interviews, which. Uh, is in the play. There's a lot of stuff that was uh, said throughout our interview process that I, you know, took the artistic liberty and, and decided to use. But in many ways, I still feel that no, um, there's bits of a lot of people that we've met, but nobody is totally in, no, nobody is totally 100% an individual that we met in the so and that's why in many ways I feel that they're still um, my characters. Um, but do, other, do other writers feel that way? And I wish Dan was here to say this because this stuff is so accurately specific. Well, I was just going to say that Dan has more of a documentary right. style uh, in his solo performances at least. And Dan has gone through now a process where he's... he's it's very much still in development, his piece, because he has moved. Originally, he was, he was going to be possibly be a solo show. So he went in and did his interview processes and, and sort of started to create it that way. And then it became, then he, had, he literally just wanted actors to read it, uh, the stuff that he collected. And he was so excited by the different voices of the actors being in the room that he decided to make it a play with actors. So I would like to hear his perspective, but um, I think he's sort of very much involved in figuring that out right now. And I would just say, I mean, I think coming from documentary world, like the whole, I think you kind of recognize how much you as a person, even any any one of us that went and talked to people, it, I'm sure it varied when you were talking to them versus you, you know, like we as people bring ourselves when we are in conversation mm -hmm. and people respond mm -hmm. to us really differently. Mm -hmm. So the second we went into those communities and brought whoever we were, that changed a lot. And so I, I and that shapes it. And I think for me, a lot of the beauty was trying to draw out from the interviews what were the things that resonated with us as a team and that we thought really should really did reflect the community that we could show them and sort of hold up a mirror to them. Um, so I think there's a lot of shaping that is possible with, even if you're doing verbatim stuff. And and similarly to, to what Rachel was saying, um, I, I, I actually really tried to defer you know, any preconceptions about what the play would be, especially the more surprises that I encountered in, in these communities. Um, but there were things that, that, that shocked me and moved me, and, and I realized that that was starting to, to, to give me a, a point of view. But really, where, um, even, even if I tried to keep myself out of it, when, when it came to the stage of, of trying to, to make an evening in the theater, to, to make uh, you know, an experience that an audience could, could follow and invest in, um, that, that's where I think uh, kind of inevitably um, my sensibility as, as a playwright and a lot of the things that, that, I, that I feel very deeply about um, began to began to shape what, what the play was. But it certainly didn't, didn't start there, which was <laughs> thrilling and scary. Um, I had a, I think I put my little playwright stamp on it by like choosing what to focus on. It's like, well, it's the elephant in the room. Like, I'm just, I'm just gonna go for it, you know? So it was sort of like you were saying like, well, I chose what the piece was gonna focus on. And that's like, all right, well, 
yeah, we're going to talk about Eric Garner, you know, yeah, that's going to come up, yeah, there's going to be some race stuff, and yeah, we're, you know, that's, that, because that's what, I, I, I can't escape it, you know, um, but then, once you decide that, you know, it, you just do the work as a writer, you know, and you, you find a way to love all of your characters, um, you find a way to love even the ones who you just don't want to in real life, you know? Um, so the guys that I didn't really get to talk to, like that voice, that absent voice that I mentioned earlier actually became like the most prominent, like he's the, the, the anchor of the play was, uh, you know, that guy. And, and how do you love that guy? Like how do you love that guy who like posts really hor horrible racist things on, you know, articles about Michelle Obama, you know, or like, who, uh, you know, turns his back on the mayor at the, you know, at the funeral of the cops. Uh, who, the guy who, you know, when we approached, we, uh, restaurant owner, um, Italian pizzeria type joint, and we go in, we're all excited because we're like, oh, Italians in Staten Island, okay, we need to talk <laughs> with you, right? Um, and so when we approach, it's me, and, you know, T uh, Teresa, the dramaturg, who's also black, and then, Kristen, and you know, the only hand he goes to shake is Kristen's. How do you love that guy, you know? So it was work. <laughs> it was, um, and really trying to um, understand why, you know, and, and where, where that behavior comes from, and um, just trying to, to treat every voice and every character fairly and not sort of rely on your um, your own personal <laughs> your, your own personal crap, you know? Like, Leap! <laughs> um, yeah. Would you ever write that character if this was completely like not a prompt and you were just sitting in front of the computer? You know, I don't know. I really don't. I definitely do. I mean, in other plays I've got characters who, you know, I don't, I, I don't approve of. <laughs> uh, but I, I really think um, I, I've never had to work that hard to understand uh, someone that I'm, I'm writing. So it's great. So then to expand on that, it's an exercise in developing characters that you wouldn't normally ever or have access to, or you know, because really in terms of playwright, yeah, you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you want you want those singular voices that you can invent and you're trying to draw from your own inner experience and this exposes you to other points of view and people you may not write. Do you feel that's true? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of these characters I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought of writing without meeting them. And I have to say, this was one thing that came up in our sort of like passing time with, as we were switching casts and everything. It, we did a quick survey of the last plays that we've seen, or last workshops that we've seen, and we've got five plays full of things that the community was bursting to reveal in some way that don't find their way on stages mm. anywhere. Right. And one wonders, as artists, as shamans, you know, <laughs> what, what are we, what, what are we, what are we hearing? Um, when we're creating, if we're not here in the space where we live. Okay. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> and our live stream on. Um, unless we have any Twitter questions. We have, we have a Twitter question that is really quick. The question is, did the teams get to pick their partners, or were they foisted upon each other? I was foisted. You may want to read the question, Teresa. I don't know if my voice is carrying. Oh, did the did the um, teams have the opportunity to choose each other? Uh, well, so it's different for for it was like, I, I took the first stab at it. Um, you know, playing matchmaker, honestly, because there are some interesting things about all of these artists that I love and, and know or know from afar that I thought, oh, these two people together are going to challenge and expand each other's process. So some people were foisted 
and, <laughs> and then in others found found each other. So Dan, for instance, you want to maybe talk well, about that? Maureen was the, the artist that we approached uh, originally about the project, and Maureen said, you know, I'd love to do it, and I'd love to bring Dan on. I mean, that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. I think it happened in different ways in each of the each of the pairings. Mm -hmm. But there was some foisting going on, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kristen, you came on board um, because um, Chisa originally had a different collaborator, and we had already been in the community, and when that collaborator wasn't really going to be available after all, you knew exactly who you needed to be working with. <laughs> so we just were like, well, of course, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So well, I just want to say something. Yes. I, I'm on the board of working here, and I saw all the plays yesterday, and I love them all. But I, thank you for bringing up that we're going to bring the different boroughs to the other boroughs, because it's so perfect that the people who, the cultish people of uh, Electchester, who recognize the cultishness of the Staten Island Italians, right. are watching them. You know? And I think that the people in the Bronx <clears throat> would appreciate the card that they picked up on the floor, and Harry, uh, you know, looking behind their back and saying, help another person, because they were always giving mm -hmm. money to the next person who needed it more. Right. You know. That's a great point. Thank you for that. Okay, well, I guess I just want to say congratulations, and do you have a last word? Well, thank you for moderating this. Yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. This was, yeah. And I'm sure that everyone, and thank you to the HowlRound and to yes. the HowlRound audience. Um, and I'm sure people will want to stay and chat more. Yeah. So we will do that. We will do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.